Okay, Jim. Hey, welcome to All Things Crime. How you doing? It's good to see you, Jared. Oh, I'm doing fantastic, especially now that I got you on. Well, thanks. Happy New Year. <laughs> you too. It's yeah, a, happy uh, 2021. Let's yeah, pray let's that it's, it's better than 2020, one. right? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Hopefully, I don't. I don't want to jinx it, but hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's. I, I don't want to say it, it can't be worse because it yeah, of course it could, <laughs> but no, definitely. Um, who would have thought, you know, one year ago when we were first ramping up for the, the new decade in 2020 and everybody was all excited about it. The economy was humming. And I mean, I had a couple of trips. I, I was over in Asia for mm -hmm. the, toward the end of, um, end of actually January. And then all of a sudden this, COVID thing hit and holy crap, the whole yeah. world got turned upside down. Well, what's crazy is that two years ago, we um, almost three years ago, we sold the show to Netflix and produced that show and released it on January 3rd, 2020. Mm. And the show, name of the show was Pandemic. And <laughs> we literally were approached by some epidemi epidemiologists epidemiologists i think yeah, how you that's say a it. tongue twister there yeah and they said that look it's been a hundred years and it's going to happen at some point and we're monitoring all these different flocks of birds and herds of animals and all over the world and right. we're looking to try to stop it before it turns into a pandemic but we really need more preparedness especially here in this country and some other countries we sought this series based on the fact that it had been a hundred years since the last pandemic and there was very little preparation for the next one and we were woefully unprepared as we all learned in march of 2020 but you can see it on, on Netflix. You can see that we shot it the year before all around the world and the different things that large cities and small town hospitals were doing and not doing to prepare for a pandemic. And I think that, you know, now we know that this kind of thing is real and it's very deadly. And I mean, we are fortunate that the numbers near as bad as they were in but um, at least, you know, 350,000 Americans are dead and many, many millions have been infected. And who knows what the long-term effects are going to be. So this is a real eye-opener. Yeah, it's, it's been pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. So you, um, I know you're there in LA and you guys have got some pretty serious restrictions on you. And so, yeah. uh, but that's interesting as far as the, the show that you, that you were talking about it. I didn't know you guys produced that. I know you've produced yeah. uh, tons of other stuff like, geez, man, Criminal Minds and with the <laughs> Memphis Three and yeah, West uh, Memphis Three and yeah, uh, we did uh, you know Killer Profile and we did a lot of audio series as well. Uh, Evil has a name. Call me God. Uh, we just dropped Brooklyn North um, and we're about to drop Where the Devil Belongs and that is about the Unabomber case. Oh so, wow. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things going on. We have four other titles that are going to be released this year. And, uh, and hopefully, we'll have a couple of new uh, series on uh, CBS, Paramount Plus, and, and Fox. So we're just waiting for the uh, ability to get back to production. Oh, very cool. You know, the, the crazy thing about uh, Jim, you know, it's, I, I was so excited to get on with you that I didn't even introduce you. you know, the audience doesn't even know who I'm talking to. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, my fault. Hey, just for everybody that's, uh, that's watching or listening, uh, I'm, I'm speaking with Jim Clemente. Boy, how do I introduce you, Jim? I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, former um, FBI profiler and uh, extraordinaire as far as once you've, wow, once, once you got out of the FBI, started XG Productions and... You know, I'm, I know I'm just butchering this. And so yeah, I'll, tell that's you all what, right. I, I'll turn it over to you and let you introduce yourself. OK, to, well, uh, to you know, um, as you said, I was uh, I was an FBI agent for 22 years, an FBI profiler. Uh, and uh, I was uh, my rank was supervisory special agent. And uh, I was a particular expert in the field of uh, abductions and child abduction, homicides and rape and serial murder. And 
Uh, those were all very pretty grim topics, but just it was an honor to work in those fields and to help move the needle forward in terms of preventing those crimes, understanding the offenders and trying to get ahead of it and trying to stop these things from happening. And also when a child abduction happens, the research we did told us that you have to respond immediately and not wait for uh, the typical 24 hours to determine what happened. Uh, mm -hmm. That used to be something when, you know, when a teenager went missing and, and so forth. Um, or young adult, they would say, well, we'll wait 24 hours. But we found out through our research that when a child is abducted and killed, first hour, 44% of them are gone, 73% in the first three hours and 99% in the first 24 hours. So waiting a day is extremely lethal. You have to work and determine what went on immediately and do concentric circle searches around the last known sighting and neighborhood canvases and car stops and all sorts of social media checks and everything that you possibly can immediately because that's the only way you have a hope of saving a child's life. That's an area that I became an expert in. I, during the course of my work at the BAU, unfortunately, uh, got cancer. And uh, that was uh, when I was, when I responded to the World Trade Center on 9-11 and um, myself and a whole bunch of cops and firemen and other FBI agents and some of the other construction workers that were there and other first responders were, were stricken with uh, lymphoma. And, uh, and, you know, some of my friends and colleagues didn't make it. And so I was lucky to have a bone marrow transplant, Johns Hopkins was an experimental stem cell transplant uh, in 2004. And um, here I am today, so I'm very lucky. But while I was recovering from that, uh, I got a call from one of the guys at, at work and he said, there's an actor here and he wants to meet uh, profilers. And he said, uh, isn't there anybody in the FBI with a personality? <laughs> so I guess they had brought him around to different uh, the administrators and he wasn't really impressed. So anyway, he called me and I said I'd meet him and I walk into this. I had to wear at the time it was very unusual. I had to wear a mask and gloves uh, to meet anybody because I was still recovering from the bone marrow transplant. My immune system was almost non-existent. At the time. And I walk in and. Mandy Patankin walks up to me and he said, hi, I'm Mandy Patankin. And I said, of course, you're Mandy Patankin. You think I'm stupid? <laughs> and he just busted out laughing because I was so, you know, I was I felt like a jerk walking around in what is now normal clothes or a clo outfit or a PPE. So we sat down. He asked me uh, to tell him about my best case and my worst case, which you might recognize that as the name of one of my podcasts because that did give me the idea for that podcast mm -hmm. um, to tell, have law enforcement officers and attorneys tell their stories of the best cases and the worst cases of their careers, the things that hang with them even years after they retire. And so Mandy asked me and I said, look, I, I'll tell you my best case. And I told him about a child abduction case where I was able to help save a six-year-old boy. 28 hours after he was abducted. And I said, I'm not telling you my worst case because it's, it's too horrible. It's not for entertainment purposes. But afterwards, he picked up the phone, called Mark Gordon of Mark Gordon Productions and said, all right, I'll do the show, but you got to meet this guy, Jim. I want to base my character on him. So Mandy's character was based on me for the show Criminal Minds. And when Mandy left the show a couple of years later, uh, we kind of spread my character out to to the other guys in the show, like Hotch and Joe Montaigne, David Rossi character, and Shamar Moore's character. So uh, I became the tech advisor on the show. Season two, I wrote my first freelance episode. Uh, when I retired five years later, I came on to the show full time and made, uh, you know, some... Uh, amazing TV, I would say, because they allowed me to write about things that educated people while they were being entertained. And that was a really important thing for me because I told you the statistics earlier about child abductions. Right. In the entire time I was in the BAU, 12 years, I taught about 60,000 
cops and related professionals. It's a lot of people, 50 at a time, most of the time. <laughs> yeah. But, that's but pretty much that, end, end, endless. Uh, yeah. That's training, a lot. Right. Yeah. But I wrote my first scene of criminal minds. I, put those statistics out and Dr. Reed walks into sort of a green screen while he's telling the group these statistics. And now he's out on a, uh, you know, playground and there's 10 kids playing around, you know, on swings and jungle gym and slides. And, and when he says in the first hour, 44% are, are killed, half of them disappear. And then three hours, 75%, three quarters of the kids are gone. And then, there's one kid left swinging. And he said, after 24 hours, 99% are gone. And then the swing swings empty and the hair stood up on the back of my neck. And I was like, wow, that visual image really impacted me. And in that one minute, I reached 18 and a half million people. And by the time it goes through syndication, about 60 million people worldwide in one minute of television. And that told me exactly what I wanted to do when I retired, because I've learned a tremendous amount uh, in the BAU and the FBI. Before that, I was a prosecutor in New York City. And all that culminated in a tremendous amount of knowledge that I really feel compelled to share with people because it'll help make this world a safer place. I don't want people to have to knock on the door and tell parents that their kid is no longer with us. That's just a horrible thing. And I'm hoping that, you know, with these shows that we're producing, that we're doing some good with Hollywood's money. Yeah, no kidding. And in fact, that's the number one reason that I started this video cast and, you know, podcast, whatever it's. And I, I think most of this, especially the true crime genre, I think it's oriented around that. You know, there's a lot of guys like you that have law enforcement experience, military experience. You know, it's all about, educating the general population really what's actually out there and right you know I, I talk to my kids and stuff that are playing on the internet and they're playing Fortnite and all these other things and i'm like hey listen this is this is all fun and games but there's a risk uh, yeah if if somebody named sally that you don't know starts talking to you about where you live and things like that uh that that should be a red flag and right educating people is is what it's all about and educating your kids is really yeah. important because i always say that you know parents try to keep their kids safe by you know sort of having this wall of protection around them and and nurturing them and keeping them naive but if you had a busy street in front of your house you would never keep them safe by not telling them that it's a dangerous street by not telling them to stop and look both ways and wait for their mother or father to walk them across until they're old enough. You never not tell them about the risk right. but when it comes to sex crimes and sexual victimization and abduction. We don't tell our kids and we think that's helping them, but it's not no. because you can empower them by telling them in a very supportive, loving, positive way that you're there for them and they could take these steps to help make their lives safer and everybody's going to be happier and healthier that way and as long as they know they can help participate in their own protection and that's a wonderful thing absolutely you know it again it's all about keeping kids safe keeping family safe and mm -hmm. with the with the injunction of so much technology in our lives it's just impossible to not factor in those kind of things. Right. And, and especially when you, there's so many creepy guys out there that- Well, there's creepy girls too. Don't yeah, forget that. Yeah, there are, but <laughs> I bet you got a stat regarding how many, you know, what percent of the creepy well, people out there. The, uh, the only stats regarding male versus female offenders have to do with teachers. And in the educational system, 33% of, the offenders in one study, and it's the biggest study that I'm aware of, were female. So 67% were male and 33% were female. So one in three, it's not a tiny number. It's not something mm -hmm. that you should disregard. Um, in fact, I know I saw recently a bulletin uh, you know, board or a, um, 
uh, you know, big advertisement. You know, this is what they do in Hollywood. They they have these billboards with uh, shows that are coming out soon. And there's one that's called a teacher. And it had a female teacher and a, a teenage male student in the in the background. And I've I'm sure that, that yeah. the I'm sure that the theme of that is that, you know, she can't help herself and she falls in love with this kid, you know, and they make it a love story like Barbara Walters tried to do with respect to Mary Kay Letourneau, who sexually victimized a 12 year old boy repeatedly uh, and over and over and over again, went to jail three times and then married him when she got out of jail. Um, she passed away this past year, but I know that her victim, who later became her husband, uh, suffered all sorts of emotional, psychological, and alcoholism problems. And it took him a while to realize until their kids got to be 12 years old, he didn't realize how much she had taken advantage of him. But at that point, he did. So it's just, they are real offenders and they are a real risk to the community. Uh, we just have to keep our eyes open to both of them, both types, both genders. Absolutely. So, hey, while we're on the, on the subject of your past experiences, can you actually give a, an example of like your best case? Sure. Well, I might as well tell you the same case I told Mandy. Um, okay. I, when I was in the FBI, I was uh, a training agent for a new agent who had been a, um, a naval engineer uh, in a submarine, a uh, really bright young guy named Brent. We had worked together for about two years, and uh, I bought him on some of his first interviews. Uh, luckily, I was doing some sort of high-profile cases. Uh, I brought him to the White House and, and the executive office building and we did some really cool things and we went up to new york city and interviewed the former chief of staff of the white house and so forth um and he was he was a great guy and an incredible agent and uh then he got transferred to uh upstate new york uh, where he was from originally and we didn't see each other that often but he called me and said, hey, I'm in town. So we got together for dinner and we sat down just at, at one of my favorite restaurants, Maggiano's. And, uh, and just then I got, I got a page and um, I called them back. It was from Seattle division. And they said, we had a six-year-old boy abducted 23 hours ago. And immediately, as you know, because of the statistics I told you, I was very concerned about his safety because it's 23 hours into it and it's rather late in the game. So I, I immediately went outside and uh, with my cell phone and started talking to them, debriefing them on, on what they knew about the case. And it was a six-year-old boy who was playing with a few of his friends, five and six years old, outside of their apartment on a fairly busy street. And um, a guy came up to them and said he lost his kids can anybody help him find them and nobody did anything they just kind of kept playing and the guy went on uh, within the hour he was seen at a at a grade school uh, down the street and then uh, he's back and he asked these kids again and this little boy named Davry said I'll help you mister and he's last seen walking off hand in hand with this guy towards this guy's white truck and the witnesses were all five and six year old kids. And they said, they described the guy as a white male, 20 to 50 years old and with a bump on his head and a white truck, period. They have no other information. And immediately I said, look, this guy is in this neighborhood three times within the hour and nobody sounds the alarm. He's from this neighborhood. He's hunting in his own neighborhood probably because his inhibitions have been reduced by high levels of stress or alcohol or drug use. So you're looking for someone who has those conditions and lives in this neighborhood. They said, well, we don't have any suspects. And I said, did anybody 
what tell the community anything about this and yeah we put out an apb for this guy uh we're looking for a pedophile who abducted this kid and did you get any responses no yeah you're not going to what you should do is put out uh, that you made a mistake that you're looking for a hero this guy doesn't know it but he's the last person to see davry and he could help us figure out where davry went and so now you're asking people to tell anybody in anybody in the neighborhood that they saw who has a white truck is 20 to 50 years old and might have a bump on his head and might have been seen with this kid. They get two calls back about two different people. And one of them has a white Subaru Forester. They check it out and there's some dents on the Forester. I said, that makes sense. He has a bump on his head. He probably had an accident. He was probably drunk, had an accident. And that's what these kids saw kicking his door. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We don't know anything about this guy. And I said, you don't need to know anything about this guy. And I had to argue all the way up to the chief of police and then the district attorney. I said, look, the United States Constitution gives you the right to do a search for the safety of the child if that child's life is at risk. I told him the statistics, this kid's life is definitely at risk, kick in the door now. And eventually I was able to convince them that they were able to do this, not search for the offender, but a safety search for the child. They kick in the door. No, they, they, they mustered a SWAT team around the corner, came in, kicked in the door. I'm listening to it live on my phone and I hear them say, he's here. He's alive. And again, the hair stood up on the back of my neck because mm. I was like, if I hadn't argued and yelled and screamed, then who knows what would have happened to this kid? What we found out later was that the window to his apartment overlooked the parking lot around the corner where the SWAT team mustered. So when they were getting together, he saw them and he took off. So he wasn't there, but we set up on his car in the parking lot and at 3 a.m. he tried to come back and get his car. And that's when he was arrested. He was arrested and convicted and thrown in jail. And that was one of the best cases of my career because this kid defied the odds and he's still with us. And that's a wonderful thing. Wow. That is awesome. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. No problem. Yeah. You know, in fact, when you said he's here, man, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I was like, ah, oh, you know, that's just a, yeah. uh, yeah, it's a rare thing to, to be able to say that that happened because it's such a, you know, it's a, an unfortunate set of statistics about it. I mean, 62% or 63% of non-familial long-term child abductions are fatal. So two out of three, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's something that we have to act quickly on and and we have to understand the severity of it they don't happen that often i mean it happens across the country two or three times a week though and that's a lot and it's not something that anybody ever should have to go through so being aware of the circumstances and and also not just telling kids about predators and stranger danger because most offenders will use a ruse. Most offenders will try to get close to your kids. And there's a number of good books, Child Lures by Kenneth Wooden. Okay. And, uh, and there's also a book um, by Joel Kostaix, uh called The Well-Armored Child. Um, those are good books. And of course, for the parents to read The Gift of Fear and Protecting the Gift. Those are two books by Gavin De Becker. And so you want to protect your kids, you want to help them understand these are good books to read so that you can actually be better equipped to protect them from anything that might happen. But one of the reasons why I say not to teach kids just about stranger danger and these predators is those words put into mind, you know, some evil looking weird person, mm -hmm. whereas most of the offenders, uh, the offenders who are sophisticated will try to get close to your kids by grooming them take time and then take advantage of them. And 
it's a it's a very it's a much more controlling process it doesn't light up all the alarms and it is actually the statistics are are very very disturbing in that one in four kids before they hit their 18th birthday in this country will be sexually victimized in some way so it's a very, now, those very prevalent huge problem there's an operation underground here in in utah that or it's centered here in Utah, it works all over the world, but uh, those guys are huge with, you know, the yeah. sex trade and mm -hmm. uh, trying to sting those type of operations and, and shut right. those down. And they, they do some great work. But I, I guess one of my questions is, is that that number you said one in four, by the time they reach 18, is that number increasing? Or is that, you know, because when you think of like the 50s, you know, in the sixties and things, you know, before the sexual revolution of the sixties, I imagine that that happened a lot. It just wasn't talked about. All right. Well, there's, there's different types of offenders and we have to get into that to really discuss this topic. So there's, there are actually preferential offenders, people who are sexually attracted to children. Some of those are exclusively attracted to kids. Some can be attracted to adults and kids, but there on the other end of that spectrum is situational offenders. These are people who are sexually attracted to adults, but because a kid is available, vulnerable, and the person is, you know, horny, they take advantage of a kid. So there are different, those different kinds of offenders and everything in between, all the gray area in between. When you're talking about whether it's increasing, I believe that the problem of sexual victimization of children was something that occurred in the home and in the community uh, prior to the internet. Now, kids can be sexually victimized by people anywhere in the world because through their phone and through their laptops and through their other internet devices, even all the games they play online, they mm -hmm. can be sexually victimized. They can be groomed and sexually victimized through, through those methodologies. So it did increase the number of and opportunities for those crimes. What, the numbers that I related to you, uh, some people have stated, uh, studies have said that it's one in four girls that get vic sexually victimized and one in six boys. I believe boys underreport much to a much greater degree than girls underreport but also there have been some long-term longitudinal studies about um, with people who have discussed what has happened when, the, you know, when they were a child, when they were under 18, and those numbers came back uh, solidly 25% of those respondents, and it was huge, huge numbers in that study had been sexually victimized in some way by the time they were 18. So um, I, I believe those numbers, and I think that there are just new ways that people get access to kids and the ability to traffic kids and to interact with other like-minded offender individuals is certainly increased with the internet. Uh, at the beginning of the internet, they, it was completely lawless, but I was part of a number of large long-term undercover operations. I trained a bunch of ICAC, Internet Child Against, Crimes Against Children, task forces, and undercover agents over the course of my career. There are ICAC task forces across the country and around the world. And there's a lot of cooperation with Interpol and with Scotland Yard and other major agencies. Um, uh, the FBI, the Secret Service, the Marshals, the DEA, everybody's involved in trying to combat online child pornography and child sex crimes. So there is more manpower, and by that I mean man and woman power, addressing these issues today and using technology to catch these people and prevent things like that from happening. And NICMIC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, is at the forefront of that. So there's all sorts of new ways that we're able to combat a problem. It just took us about a decade to catch up to what was going on. And because technology is constantly changing, mm -hmm. we're always going to be playing catch up. And that's something that needs funding and needs people who are dedicated to helping save kids in order to stop this kind of just, you know, horrific behavior. Yeah. So if you were to give advice to somebody listening to this, what would you tell them is, I mean, 
obviously you can't shelter yourself nearly the way we used to be able to like you know when I was growing up man it's like after school mom would say just be home before uh before it's dark and before the street lights come out <laughs> right uh you could go play in the streets and go play at parks and you didn't have to constantly be be watched or supervised by an adult but I think we're uh, just more aware of it today uh -huh. I don't believe that the risk to the average kid has increased that significantly okay good but i do believe that we are more intelligent today and we are aware of things that happen all over the place before it was like i said a community problem so you might find out something in your community that means in your home in your neighborhood in your schools in your sports teams in your community organizations and in, in your church and your you know boy scout troop or or whatever uh, or Girl Scout troop, those are the things that we used to learn of these kinds of things in that small, isolated area that, that you basically roam in. Now, through the internet, we hear of all this stuff happening all over the world almost instantaneously. So it scares us more. What we shouldn't do is think that means we need to keep our kids even more sheltered because it's not gonna happen they are going to be exposed to this because if they don't have a phone or a computer, their school does, their library does, their friends do. Mm -hmm. One case where I showed up where a child went missing, they had no idea what happened to her. And when I actually interviewed her best friend, it turns out that on that day when they were walking to the grocery store and back, their mother, one of their mothers sent them out to the grocery store. This girl and her friend stopped at the library and got online and she was talking to a 30 year old guy mm. and she arranged to meet him. And unfortunately, the library erases the data on their computers every night. So we were enable, never able to trace that interaction because of it. And it's really sad. Uh, as far as I know, that case has never been resolved. And that is because her parents thought they were protecting her, but didn't realize that she had this access. The access is there. And believe me, if you don't talk to your kids about sex or sexual victimization, there are definitely people out there who would love to talk to them about it. Right. Because that's part of the grooming process. And kids are curious about sex because as adults, we, we give all these nonverbals where we tell them not to talk to us about sex. Because if it comes on the radio, we turn it off. On the TV show, we don't let them watch it. We don't let them watch, uh, we block them on the, on the internet from sexually related topics and videos and so forth. So they know that this is not something their parents want to talk to them about. And so they don't go to their parents when something comes up in a sexual nature. And that's unfortunate. If you're open with your child about sex from day one, there's no reason not to start talking to them like you talk to them when they're in, you know, a tiny little baby when, just after they're born. The earlier you start, the less of a hurdle it is to get over to talk to them. The longer you wait, the harder it is to talk to your child about sex. And you don't have to do it in an outrageous way. You can do it in a sexually appropriate way, age appropriate for that child. And you can do it in a loving, caring, supportive way. Make sure they know that you're doing this to help protect them. You're teaching them something and it's a wonderful thing and they will grow up and things will develop and so on and so forth. And, and you, you know, you can do this. And if you do that, what you're doing is you're preventing your kids from hearing rumors and searching out information away from you. They'll come to you with questions. You gotta get rid of your hangups about it before you can talk to your kids about it. So right. it's something that I think every parent needs to do just because it is a real and present risk for every kid. Yeah, well, we adopted three little boys uh, eight, nine years ago. Oh. And, you know, the twins were two and a half and the, the baby was just under one. Wow. And we decided from day one that when we started talking to them about 
being adopted and you know they have some hispanic blood in them and so they they obviously don't look exactly like me and if that ever came up we wanted to have a good a good example and a good reason for it mm-hmm. and so we decided let's just preempt that and talk to them about it and be open about it and uh, they they have relationships with their other biologicals brothers and sisters and things and it's worked out really well it's awesome. never really come up as a question Right, because oh, they knew, you yeah. Know, because you were open. If you hide something, they're gonna they're be gonna curious. find out. Yeah, they're gonna find out, and they're gonna be curious. And again, there are so many avenues for them to get information, and most of them are not gonna be protected avenues, and some of them are gonna set them up for victimization. So why even risk that? Oh, absolutely. So hey, uh, one of the things that I think the last time we actually talked was when that West Memphis three show came out Mm -hmm. and obviously switching gears here a little bit. So uh, did a little M backing on that show. Yeah, that was awesome, man. I, and of course, uh, you know, know, I've been one of your biggest fans ever since I met you. Oh yeah. And that was just the coolest thing. And you know, the discussion with you and I can't remember the Bob Ruff. Yes. Yes. Yeah. A stud, man. That was a great show. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, I tell you, when we were watching the videos of a particular interview and I heard him say that he waited at the restaurant for the cops to come to make the report away from his house, you know, that hair that stands up on the back of your, that's what happened. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh my God, he didn't want the cops at his house. Why wouldn't you make the report from your home? Why wouldn't you have the cops come to your home so that if your kid arrived back home, you'd be there rather than him coming to an empty home? If you didn't know your kid wasn't coming home, yeah, you could make that move. But if you thought your kid and your kid was supposed to be home, if you thought your kid was coming home, why would you stay at this restaurant away from home and keep your wife there too for a cop? waiting for a cop to arrive and then waiting to make this whole report that whole time your kid could have been at home and you never knew. And that sounded very inconsistent with a father who was actually looking for his child. So that yeah. just kind of perked my ears up. And then you listen to little details and nuances of what he said. And that created a lot of suspicion in my mind. That case had a ton of just bizarre things going on. So yeah. But the other thing that really clicked in my mind in talking to Bob, because he asked me, you know, he asked me some question very early on. And I said, you have to understand, this is the only triple homicide of eight-year-old boys in United States history that I'm aware of. It's never happened before in my career or since in my career. So let's look at why. Is it a triple homicide of three eight-year-old boys or is it a homicide of one boy? and the murder of two eyewitnesses. And that changed Mm -hmm. everything because you're not looking for some kind of monster that would run around and kill three boys. What you're looking for is somebody who probably killed somebody out of rage and then had to cover his tracks. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a much more realistic crime, especially for that neighborhood, for the situation. And, you know, had the investigating officers taken that tact immediately, Instead of looking for Satanists, it would have saved three young men a couple decades in prison, and it would have actually probably resolved the case, a case that still remains open today. Yeah, it's fortunate. As far as the MVAC goes, you know, we've never had a shot at some of that evidence, the sticks, I know. Uh, things that like... Uh, and the knots, and, the and knots, a, yeah. Yeah, the knots of the ropes. Um, even the clothing that he had to have stripped off there, mm-hmm. you know, if they would have found him relatively soon, you know, that's not, and, and if it was stored properly, you know, there's, there's a chance. And I know, and so, uh, a request and hopefully one day they will com- yeah. apply and they will move the case forward. But um, to think that they still consider this case closed and resolved with the Alfred plea that, that is literally insane. It's insane to think that those three guys had anything to do with this is just, it's, it's, it's just pure ignorance. 
Okay. Well, it's it's a, and in fact that, that that kind of segues into something that I was discussing, I think, with Cloyd Steiger. Um, I don't know if you know him, a homicide mm -hmm. detective yeah. out of Seattle. Yeah, it's interesting that there's almost a compartmentalization in agencies when it comes to cases. And well, in fact, I was talking to Lee Miller as well, and he was saying, you know, at some junction, most detectives are going, especially a homicide detective, are going to come upon a, a period in a case. You know, this, this isn't the run-of-mill homicide. This is the mm -hmm. one where uh, there's something weird going on here, like exactly what I would put the, the West Memphis 3 in, mm -hmm. where they're like, you know what? This needs to be taken up to another level. We've got to bring in some expertise from the outside and look at this and, and make sure that we're on the right track. Because like you said, everything is time sensitive, especially when it involves children. Yeah. And so the more time that you spend on a certain case or on a certain path, especially if that path is not accurate, then the further away, you know, it's, it's like a, an aircraft that's off by two or three degrees after an hour. It's, that's a long ways off. Absolutely. And, you know, unfortunately with, the fleeting nature of forensic evidence and eyewitnesses and anybody who might be able to help or the ability to destroy evidence on somebody who did bad things. Time is not our helper. It's definitely an enemy. Well, I, I've kept you for a while. So before I go, you know, one of my favorite things about doing this show is finding something and lightening things up a little bit and okay. maybe finding something that's a little more humorous. So if you were at uh, Thanksgiving dinner, you got your friends and family around you and, you know, pre-COVID, obviously, because you can't yeah. do that now, but, and somebody was saying, Jim, tell us the funniest thing that has ever happened to you in your career. I'm sure you've got a couple of those in your back pocket. What would you, what would you say? Wow. Well, I, I guess it, it has to be, it has to be the, the Fox incident. So I was living in Washington, D.C. and working in Quantico uh, in the behavioral analysis unit. And somebody told me about a, um, an auction that was, you know, they were auctioning tools at this house in Fredericksburg, Virginia, which is closer to where, where I was working. And I went there and I bought some tools and I ended up buying the house, too. And I moved to Fredericksburg, Virginia, you know, from New York City to the middle of the woods. Literally, uh, the house was surrounded by like 1800 acres of woods and it was incredibly isolated and just, you know, nice and quiet and all that, but it was surrounded by woods. And one day I'm getting in my car on the way to work and I throw my stuff in and I put my right foot in and I go to sit down and my left foot is stuck on something. And I look and it looks like this big furry cat is humping my leg. <laughs> Only I realized that it's got big teeth and it's biting my ankle and it's a fox. I had never seen a fox before. I never met one and certainly didn't expect one to be attached to my leg like this. So I get out and of course, my first instinct is grab my gun to shoot it. And then I was like, no, somebody is setting me up because this thing came out of nowhere and I thought I'm being punked and there's a camera somewhere. And so I was like, they want me to shoot myself in the foot, right? That's what's going to happen here. And so I put my gun away and I'm like slamming it against the car and I'm, I have to <laughs> eventually use some very choice language and, and I dragged it all the way into the garage. It won't let go. And I grab a shovel and I start whacking it over the head and finally it let go, lets go and runs uh, under my car. So I go inside and I call 911 and I'm calmly telling them, well, I'm not really calmly telling them, I'm screaming like a little girl. Uh, ah, this wild animal's attacking me, oh my God, that's terrible. And so I, they said, calm down, sir, calm down, sir. And I can't believe this recording never showed up at my retirement, but they said, um, you have to catch it because we need to section its brain for the rabies test. And they said, whatever you do, don't do anything to its head. And I was like, oops, <laughs> oh, well. So uh, I went back outside and I grabbed like the shovel and a, garbage can and I'm going to catch this thing. Right. And I come around the corner of the house is biting on the chain link fence, trying to get at Rottweiler, which he was like, you know, here at this point. And he, you know, Fox 
sees me come around the corner, just looks at me and just comes straight at me with like hissing and foaming at the mouth and all this stuff. And I said, the hell with this. And I grab my, my gun and I do my weaver stance and I shoot him twice. No, I shoot him once and it was in the right shoulder. It goes right through him and doesn't even phase him. I shoot him again, dead center of mass and he falls down. And then because I'm from the Bronx, I go up and give him one behind the ears. You know, <laughs> you mess with the wrong guy. And then I said, what was interesting is during that time, I said to myself, oh, I'm going to have to call my neighbors and tell them why I'm shooting. You know, even though they're like a half mile away, they'll hear this. But then as I'm pulling the trigger, it just sounded like pop, pop, pop. And I don't have any head, you know, headphones on. I don't have any ear noise suppression in my ears, but it just sounded like pop, pop. And I was like, wow, I guess I don't have to call, call him. But immediately my phone starts ringing because my neighbors were calling to find out what I was shooting. So it was really loud. But that was the auditory, what's it called? Auditory, um, I can't remember what it's called, like closure where your, your ears like shut down and your focus becomes incredibly focused on the target. And I didn't, I saw that fox. What I didn't see were the two 1,000 gallon propane tanks right behind him <laughs> that I could have blown up with those shots. I mean, it was just crazy, but you just get totally focused on your target. Kind anyway, of a fight, the, fight or flight response there. Yes. Yeah. And so the, uh, the, the guy from uh, game control comes out and he gets one of those grabber things and picks it up and, and, says you know damn this thing looks like switch cheese what happened to him you know anyway he says uh you're gonna have to you know go to the hospital so i go to the hospital and the doctor says you're gonna have to get these radi rabies shots but let me give you this shot of dilaudid first i was like dilaudid isn't that like a narcotic and he said yeah this is gonna be really painful and i was like i'm not taking narcotics i'm an fbi agent you know he rolls up a towel and says bite on this and i was like are we in the old West or something? You know, you're going to give me a shot of whiskey next anyway. Oh my God. It was the most painful thing in the world. He gave me four shots around the bites on my ankle and then nine other shots in my hips and shoulders. And it, they were the most mm. painful. It was like shooting jello into you. So it was like tearing open your flesh. It was, it was very horrible. And I had to get that the first third, seventh, 14th and 28th days, all those shots. Again, it was not fun. But when he told me that it was going to be painful, I said, well, couldn't we wait and see if I actually get rabies? And he said, it's 100 percent fatal. I was like, all right, let's go. So I did juice, that. Juice me up, man. Yeah, I came home and the tail from the fox is hanging from my front door. So I was like, did I move into some voodoo kind of town here? What's going on? But apparently after the fox hunts, that's what was done. And Virginia has fox hunts that's what the winner gets the tail all right great that's what i really wanted and then i get to work the next day and my office is crossed with police line tape and on the floor is a chalk outline of a fox and three shell casings <laughs> so you know everybody's a comedian you know so my uh my colleagues thought that was kind of funny so i would say that and then the resultant reports about this at my retirement were the funniest thing that happened to me as an FBI agent. Wow. Well, I have to tell you, Jim, I've done this. Uh, I think this is like the 23rd episode of All Things Crime. And of all the stories that I have heard, that has to be one of the better, definitely one of the better ones. And Thank you. Well, I'm there's glad one with... Like uh, she was a cop in, in Ohio and she got a call one night that some guy was reporting a Sasquatch in the backyard that was like dancing around a fire. Obviously this guy was completely inebriated, but perhaps or short of, uh, short of Sasquatch. Neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure they took that into consideration. It might've been <laughs> ugly neighbors, but Short of Sasquatch in the backyard, man, that uh, fox okay. chewing on your ankles. That's a great story. It was insane. And while I was getting the, the shots the next time or two weeks later, there was a 76-year-old man who was out chopping wood in his backyard and the same exact thing happened to him. He just, out of nowhere, um, only 
he just had an axe in his hand and he just swiped the guy. The, the, he swiped down and cut the fox's head off and just walked into the hospital with the fox's head. So, so did the fox end up having rabies? He did have rabies. Yes. Well, good thing you yeah. got those painful shots. Yeah. And I didn't end up with it, which is a good thing. One yeah. thing with rabies that I learned is the time it takes is directly proportional from the, to the distance between where you're and your brain. Once it gets to your brain, you're going to die. Like a woman who was uh, cut by a bat in her hair, you know, and it clawed her scalp. Uh, she died very quickly uh, from it. And so you got to be careful. Rabies is not something you mess with. And yeah. I understand that they've done a little better in terms of the shots that they're not as frequent and, and not as horrible. So hopefully it's not as bad if anybody else gets bit by a random fox that's out trying to chew your ankles well i i've seen people like playing with raccoons and things like that and i'm just like that is a wild animal and if it's aggressive you have absolutely no idea this what they're anyway they, you know i i grew up in the woods and so i've learned a lot of these things but yeah for the people that haven't <laughs> just stay away well, from them i didn't and i knew enough to try to stay away from them <laughs> Well, hey, I'm going to end this here. So I, I appreciate your time. It's great talking to you, Jared. Okay. Hey, thanks. And, uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Keep up the good work. Take care. You too. Appreciate All it. Right.